Good morning. Okay, so I'm Zara Ashcraft from IBM Research, and I'm really excited to present to you the work we did on quantum human-computer interaction. Um, I did this work with my colleagues Justin Weiss and Mariam Ashuri from IBM Research. So quantum computing is, was once considered a purely theoretical domain, but it's rapidly becoming a reality with the availability of publicly accessible quantum computing systems, and has recently gained a lot of attention for the things that it can potentially accomplish. It has the potential to accomplish problems considered intractable for classical computers. For example, scientists have used computers to, to determine the ground state energy for beryllium hydride, a complex inorganic molecule. Performing these kinds of simulations has a tremendous computational cost, often intractable for classical computers, but the results of these simulations may lead to the discovery of new drugs and materials and even bolster clean energy efforts. So one might ask, how did HCI researchers get involved with quantum HCI? And our interest in defining a new practice of quantum HCI stemmed from our experiences in joining a new team um, that was focused on building tools for quantum scientists. As HCI researchers new to quantum computing, we found ourselves spending a lot of time familiarizing ourselves and learning new concepts and terminology that were quite outside of our comfort zone. And during this process, we realized the tremendous impact that good HCI research and practice could have on the field. So in this talk, I'm going to begin with a short primer on quantum computing. So in classical computing, information is encoded with bits that are either in a state of zero or one. In quantum computing, information is encoded in qubits, um, and as with classical computing, they can be in a state of zero or one, but they may also exist in a state of superposition, um, in which their true state is unknown until it is measured, and they may also be entangled with each other, such that measuring the state of one qubit tells us about the state of the other without measuring it. And so these are just some very basic features that make quantum computing so powerful. Next, I'm going to talk about existing quantum computing tools. So there's a numbers, number of tools available for programming quantum systems, both in simulation and with actual hardware. GUIs such as IBM's Composer and Quirk enable people to program their own quantum circuits and visualize the results. There's also programming languages and SDKs, such as IBM's QuizKit and Microsoft's Liquid, and they allow people to develop quantum algorithms and run them in simulation, sometimes on actual hardware. Next, I'm going to talk about the methods that we used. Um, so we recruited a small batch of participants from our own organization through an email seeking individuals who conduct research in quantum computing. We then did snowball sampling by asking who they would recommend to speak with, both internal and external to our organization. We had a total of seven participants from industry, government, and academia. Our interviews were semi-structured and probed the following areas, education and background, application and algorithms, programming tools and workflow, and community. So in the next couple of slides, I'm going to talk about the areas of inquiry um, which we identify through these interviews, the first of which was understanding quantum users, developing and evaluating educational materials, designing programming and debugging tools, and finally, visualizing quantum. Designing effective technologies for effective, for effective uh, programming quantum systems requires an understanding of the different types of people who will use those systems. And our quantum development team had conducted early stage user research and identified three quantum users, quantum scientists, science enthusiasts, and developers. Our first group, quantum scientists, include professors, postdocs, and graduate students in physics and quantum information science. They perform experiments using quantum simulators on real quantum computers. Science enthusiasts are people who have an interest in quantum computing, but no formal background or training in it. They may be university students, academics, and industry professionals, all with varying levels of expertise in programming. And their primary needs are for educational materials. Our third group are developers, and though this group may have an extensive knowledge on classical computing, their knowledge of quantum computing is limited. For this audience, SDKs that provide a higher level functionality and hide the lower level technical details um, of their quantum implementation are desired. 
So we believe that we captured only a preliminary snapshot of quantum computing users, and additional research is needed to more, to more comprehensively identify the people who are currently using quantum computers. One of, our, one of our participants said, I think there's another layer of user that we will eventually connect with, which is, I want to use a quantum computer to accelerate a certain aspect of a certain problem, but I want it as a piece of a much bigger solution. The technical folks in banks and finance and chemical design already have environments they are using to work inside, and I think I will eventually take quantum and plug it in. Quantum computing is a highly technical subject, and that said, there are several notable efforts that have aimed to make quantum computing more accessible, interesting, and fun. There are introductory guides um, that have low math or no math introductions to quantum computing, metaphor-based approaches to teach the fundamental principles of quantum mechanics, quantum games, and online quantum communities. So over the last decade, there have been an emergence of introductory books that are intended for general audiences. Additionally, institutions like IBM, D-Wave, and Microsoft provide introductory tutorials for beginners to quantum computing. Another approach to teach principles of quantum computing is via metaphors. So Schrodinger's cat explains the concept of superposition via thought experiment. A cat is kept in a box with a bottle of poison and is simultaneously dead and alive because it is unknown whether the cat drank the poison. And for each CI researchers here, there's an opportunity to evaluate the extent to which these guides and metaphors teach beginners about quantum computing. There's also been several noteworthy digital games designed to specifically teach about quantum computing. Quantum Tic-Tac-Toe, Mechanic, and Hello Quantum are games that both require players to solve puzzles by trying to teach quantum concepts. Entanglion is a board game designed to teach fundamental concepts of quantum computing. And for HCI researchers here, there's an opportunity to both design and evaluate the effectiveness of these games for their ability to scaffold learners through the process of understanding core quantum computing concepts to the point of programming quantum systems. So from our interviews, we found that many of issues with the online communities stem from the fact that the platforms did not distinguish between these novices and experts. And our participants, experts in their field, which is a, one of the limitations of our study, um, express preferences for specialized communities that encourage deep discussions and information exchange. That being said, we're not advocating for creating a separation or an information gate between the novices and experts, but a lot of these issues, um, these online communities can be vastly improved by applying the lessons learned by HCI and CSCW researchers in building successful online communities. I'm going to go ahead and read one of the quotes from an applied mathematician. When you go in the community, you sometimes read questions from people who clearly have no idea what quantum computing is because they have high expectations of what it can do, and that is not the case. We also asked participants about the tools and programming languages they use and discussed the potential of HCI research in the following areas. Paper, GUI, and code, documentation and sharing, debugging quantum algorithms, and quantum native programming. Despite the numerous tools available for programming quantum systems, low-fidelity tools have a strong foothold in the day-to-day -day workflow of quantum scientists. But visual tools like IBM's Composer and Quark are also really helpful in applying what has been drawn on these low-fidelity tools. And they use circuit-like metaphor in which each qubit is represented by a horizontal line. One quantum chemist said, there's a big difference between writing a circuit on a piece of paper and actually trying to implement it on a machine. It's like trying to learn computing, just reading the theory of computing, but never learning a programming language or getting anything to work or debug anything. As more people delve into quantum computing, such as science enthusiasts and developers, a need arises for environments that better integrate documentation and sharing tools. And well-documented workflows are in are integral to the learning process. As with any development workflow, debugging is a part of the quantum computing process. One participant described how she debugged her code by switching amongst different tools. When I'm trying to figure out an algorithm or debug something, I will start with the composer. And I want to make any changes, I go over to CASM, which is quantum assembly language, to change things there, and I go back and forth between the two. Another described how he used a quantum simulator to perform debugging as a simulator enabled one to view the internal state of all the qubits. To debug, we used a C simulator for everything. Out of the simulator, you can get the internal state of all the qubits. 
A deeper understanding of how quantum programmers can conduct the debugging process would provide opportunities for developing new kinds of quantum debugging tools. And this work should build on previous research that demonstrates the best practices for scientific computing. So the development of programming languages for quantum computers largely mirrors that of classical computers, but on a much more rapid time scale. Early quantum system programming evolved from placing quantum gates directly on a circuit to writing assembly-style code using the open quantum language, assembly language. But there's also newer SDKs, such as Qiskit, that rely on Python to provide a high-level abstraction, which are then translated down to the level of chasm before executing on real quantum hardware simulation. And one opportunity for HCI researchers is to consider whether these abstractions used to programming classical computers should be applied for programming quantum systems. Visualization of qubit states are difficult to create because the number of achievable quantum states is exponential with respect to the number of qubits. And so HCI researchers here can utilize information visualization methods to build more effective visualizations for quantum computing. User studies exploring the interpretability of large-scale graphs and other large-scale visualizations can contribute to improved visualizations of quantum states. So I'm going to also talk about moving forward and what next, what the future might look like. So while we favorably suggest potential directions for the expansion of quantum computing, we acknowledge that our optimism must be tempered with realities of the field. And, and so a lot of these scientists did talk about skepticism. One of the quantum chemists said, the same thing happened with nano and AI. At one point, they get hyped because they make a few advances, and then they don't deliver on their promises, and then they get trashed. So then no one gives them attention. While they are being ignored, they slowly or maybe even incrementally improve, so suddenly they have some major advances. One of our other participants said, we don't want the same thing happening with quantum as with AI, overhyping it and then realizing that you can't accomplish what you want to accomplish and then abandoning it. But these uncertainties around Quantum computing and potential for disillusionment should not be reasons to avoid approaching the field. Instead, we see them as opportunities to show the strength that great HCI research can bring. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, if anybody has questions, we have this microphone here. Uh, we, al we also have a... Um, a loose microphone and a student volunteer who's going to run around so you can just raise your hand. Any questions? Yeah. Hey, um, I'm Eliana Husky Douglas from Alta University. So I've actually heard of quantum physics, not in this sense, but more in the sort of adjunct of realism, SDS, sort of sci sci sort of thing. Do you see that more merging with this area of work? Um, that's not something that we really asked about. We were focused on these like front end, um, uh, front end tools for quantum computing. But um, I think it's it's such an expansive field and it's continuously growing. So I can imagine that there are front ending tools for those for those applications as well. Yes. Any other questions from the audience? Last chance. All right. Let's thank uh, Sarah again. <laughs>